Buenas noches, continuamos con nuestra última mesa, nuestra última mesa magistral. Es un honor y un placer presentarles al doctor Richard Dean Winfield de la Universidad de Georgia. El, hemos seguido por un tiempo su trabajo, en especial yo en lo personal, eh, tiene muchas obras, eh, entre ellas este, comentarios sobre la ciencia y la lógica y la fenomenología del espíritu. Eh, es investigador distinguido de la filosofía de la Universidad de Georgia en Estados Unidos, donde ha enseñado desde 1982. Ha sido presidente de la Sociedad para la Filosofía Sistemática, la Sociedad Hegeliana de América y la Sociedad Metafísica de América. Es autor de 21 libros, entre los más recientes se encuentran The Intelligent Mind, La Mente Inteligente, Rethinking Capital, Repensando el Capital, Conceiving Nature After Aristotle, Kant and Hegel, Concibiendo la Naturaleza Después de Aristóteles, Kant y Hegel, y, eh, y el Universal Después de la Biología, perdón, y el Universal, eh, perdón, y Biología Universal Después de Aristóteles, Kant y Hegel. Este año se postuló como candidato para el Congreso de Georgia, para el décimo distrito congresional. Entonces le damos la bienvenida al, al, al doctor Winfield y le cedo la palabra. The only good thing about losing an election la única buena <laughs> cosa de perder una elección is that it has freed me to come here and accept the invitation to be part of the fifth Congress of citizens and philosophers, straddling history and reason, as well as persuasion and dialectic. We are easily tempted to follow Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, according to which our theorizing about the world should serve the end of changing it. The whole school of philosophy has paid homage to this injunction, as if subordinating theory to practice could possibly make sense. There can be no normative critique if reason forfeits its autonomy to become subservient to anything else. Yet what could be more antithetical to the sovereignty of reason than making an emancipatory goal the conditioning telos of all understanding? If that end lords over theory, emancipation itself cannot be determined within theoretical inquiry. Instead, Philosophy must accept the aim to which it should submit as an unquestionable ground whose content and authority reason can never establish. This leaves practice hopelessly dogmatic, aiming at a liberation whose character is beyond rational disputation. It can thus be no surprise that the critical theorists who have followed Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach have never developed a concrete normative theory of the reality of freedom into which we are supposed to transform our world. The enslavement of philosophy to practice that follows from Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach more broadly reflects the general epistemological view that knowing is always conditioned by practical concerns. The leading lights of critical theory such as Horkheimer, Adorno, Marcuse, etc., who follow Marx's thesis are all students of Heidegger, who advance the existentialist dogma that the conditions of cognition lie not in some pure, otherworldly, noumenal self, but rather in a concrete, embodied subjectivity, very much practically entangled within the world it inhabits. Whether one characterizes that entanglement in terms of biological, psychological, or conventional constraints, the enfeeblement of reason is the same. Thought remains bound to practical demands that rob reason of the unconditioned independence that could allow for an unqualified wisdom rather than relative opinion. The proponents of this disempowerment of reason incoherently purport to comprehend the practical entanglement of thought that robs reason of the autonomy on which depends the truth of their own global claims. If practice reigns over theory as they pretend, how can their own diagnosis 
of the disempowerment of reason be anything more than the relative effect of some pre-theoretical compulsion. Ultimately, it makes no difference whether the conditions of knowing are attributed to a numinal subjectivity or a worldly, practically engaged self. Either route perpetrates the common defining blunder of transcendental investigation, which supplants ontology with epistemology as first philosophy. Transcendental philosophy correctly rejects starting philosophical investigation with ontology, since doing so makes direct claims about being without validating the knowing that ontology employs. Nonetheless, the transcendental turn begins equally uncritically by making direct claims about the alleged conditions of knowing without certifying its own transcendental cognition. Whether the transcendental philosopher characterizes the conditions of knowing in terms of a noumenal self, a concrete worldly subjectivity, the intersubjectivity of language, or some cultural framework, the authoritative knowing of these alleged epistemological foundations is taken for granted. This dogmatism is inevitable because the transcendental investigator always assumes that the knowing it scrutinizes is a knowing of an object, whereas the transcendental investigator engages in a knowing of knowing. Transcendental investigation must assume that the knowing it examines is different from the object of that knowing. Otherwise, the turn from ontology to epistemology would still be making direct claims about being, which is what the transcendental turn seeks to avoid. Due to this inherent difference between the knowing employed by the transcendental investigator and the knowing it examines, transcendental argument always takes for granted both the authority of its own cognition and the characterization it gives the knowing of objects it scrutinizes. To overcome this debilitating discrepancy between the knowing under investigation and the knowing employed in the investigation, knowing must do its own critique. The resulting equalization between the knowing and object of transcendental investigation, however, undermines the defining difference between knowing and its object upon which rests the possibility of investigating knowing before making claims about the object of knowledge. As it turns out, overcoming the dogmatism of transcendental inquiry leads to the same resolution as overcoming the opposition <coughs> between theory and practice that bars the way to any true conception or realization of truth and right. Theory and practice stand in opposition so long as each lacks what its counterpart provides. Theory and practice properly aim at a unification of concept and objectivity rather than just a correspondence of representation and appearance. Representation is always burdened with the residue of intuitive content which imagination modifies without ever freeing itself of given particulars that remain alien to conceptualization. Concepts have a content that is not alien to thought, but inherent in universality. Even the most abstract universal, which inheres in multiple particulars without specifying anything more about them, has a unity that entails particularity as well as individuality. A common mark cannot retain its encompassing reach without extending to a plurality of instances, whereas these instances cannot be plural unless each is individual, a differentiated particular, not just sharing in the universal, but distinguished from its counterparts. Accordingly, conceptual thinking is not empty without intuition but pregnant with imminent content. This makes the concept rather than representation the proper vehicle for grasping objectivity. Whereas appearances are relative to an undisclosed ground, objectivity is determined in its own right 
as a self-subsistent entity. As such, objectivity is worthy of being the object of true knowledge and the proper fulfillment of practice that aims at what is unconditionally worth achieving. Moreover, only conceptual thought possesses the imminent autonomy to lay hold of what is determined in its own right, instead of merely representing phenomena which are conditioned by something else. Both theory and practice aim at the unification of concept and objectivity, which Hegel identifies as the idea. Theory that is distinct from practice aims at achieving this unity in the form of a subjective truth, where conceptual thinking confronts objectivity as given to it and modifies itself to correspond to objectivity. <coughs> Although the resulting correspondence exhibits the idea it does so only in the arena of theory, where what undergoes alteration is not objectivity, but concepts that take on the content they confront. Consequently, the truth of a conceptualization that leaves its opposing objectivity unaltered is incomplete, since such theory cannot manifest the independence of its object. By contrast, practice that is distinct from theory aims at achieving the unity of concept and objectivity by transforming objectivity into the good, and objectivity made to accord with conceptual determination. Once more, the correspondence of the idea occurs on only one side, here in practice, on that of objectivity. This subverts the reality of practice. Objectivity must already contain within itself the objective process by which it develops to accord with the conceptual aim. Otherwise, the aim remains merely subjective. Yet if the development must be objective, the subjective aim seeking to realize the good never achieves anything of its own. In both cases, the alteration of concept or objectivity is not equally a transformation of its counterpart. The truth of theory remains a merely subjective idea, whereas the good of practice remains a merely objective realization, whose process of constitution does not belong to its concept. A discrepancy haunts both theory without practice and practice without theory. The equalization of concept and objectivity in theory does not occur within objectivity, whereas the modification of objectivity through practice does not occur within conceptualization. Hegel points to the overcoming of these respective shortcomings in his characterization of the absolute idea, which unifies theory and practice by achieving a conceptual development that is no less an objective transformation. This unification of concept and objectivity that is no less theoretical and practical is the working of systematic logic. It equally affords philosophy a beginning that overcomes the opposition of consciousness, that is, the differentiation of knowing from its object, allowing philosophy to proceed without making any initial claims about being or knowing. The logic with which philosophy must begin proceeds from the elimination of any distinction between knowing and its object. Logic does so by constituting a thinking of thinking, where the object of thought is indistinguishable from the thinking by which it is known. The thinking of the object is thereby the objective development of that object. Moreover, since at the outset of logic, neither the thinking nor what is thought have yet to be determined, logic proceeds with no positive presuppositions concerning subject matter or method. The constitution of the object in accord with thought and the development of thought itself here coincide in an imminent process that is entirely self-determined. The autonomy of logical thought has its counterpart in the autonomy of real agents whose self-determination constitutes an objective system of right in which freedom builds a second nature of its own. What is right is equivalent to the reality of self-determination precisely because only the objectivity of freedom comprises a world of convention 
that does not derive its character from something else. Just as logical thought unfolds without appeal to any given method or content, so the reality of self-determination is what it determines itself to be. Agents in the world do possess a given species being in a biosphere with given mechanical, physical, chemical, and ecological features. And these agents equally possess a given psychological identity that develops within a given linguistic community with pre-existing traditions. Nonetheless, to the extent that agents participate in institutions of self-determination, they give themselves conventional roles in which they jointly determine the form and content of their free agency. Within the objective reality of right, agents determine themselves as owners, as moral subjects, as co-determining spouses, as interdependent yet self-directed members of a civil society, and as self-governing citizens. Through these multiple self-determined conventional engagements, agents escape all the normative dilemmas that afflict any community ordered by given foundations. With the exception of Hegel, almost all thinkers subscribe to foundational justification, where what is true, right, or beautiful derives its normative content from some substantial or procedural ground that has the privilege of converting validity upon what possesses validity. They ignore how any attempt to ground normativity in a privileged foundation ends up subverting itself. The privileged foundation must ground its own legitimacy to, confirm, to conform to its exclusive validity conferring, conferring role. By grounding its own validity, however, the privileged foundation eliminates the difference between what confers and what enjoys validity on which foundational justification rests. This self-elimination of foundational justification reveals that normativity must reside in what is self-determined. There can be no coherent alternative. The moment normativity is heteronymous, that is, conferred upon something by something else, the privileged foundation of normativity must found its own validity to be self-referentially consistent. This once more leaves normativity residing in what grounds itself and what is self-determined. For this reason, the philosophy of right, the philosophy of normative conduct, is none other than the idea of self-determination, the objectivity corresponding to the concept of freedom. As determined in and of itself, the objective reality of self-determination has a systematic unity that gains expression in both the development of the concept of right and the genesis of the reality of right. To be systematic, the philosophy of right must present its subject matter in an ordering that is rooted in its content. This involves thinking first the most minimal structure of right, which contains no other forms of self-determination, but must be incorporated by all those that can follow in thought or reality. Hegel duly recognizes property right to be the minimal reality of self-determination. It consists in an interaction of individuals who possess a natural species being, endowing them with a psychological nature capable of thought, language, and choice. In property right, they relate to one another by laying their distinct wills in recognizable, exclusive embodiments through which they determine themselves as owners of property. This is the minimal form of self-determination because individuals must recognize one another as owners of their own bodies to be able to exercise any further type of self-determination. Otherwise, they are factors ready for appropriation by some master to whom they and their actions belong. Moral accountability comes next, since moral agents cannot recognize one another's responsibility for what they do on purpose, with intention, and conscientiously, unless they acknowledge their status as persons, as persons who own their own bodies. The emancipated family 
follows upon property and morality for two reasons. On the one hand, the free household does not itself involve any further social or political self-determination. On the other hand, the members of the emancipated family cannot wield their autonomy as co-determining spouses and parents unless they recognize one another as persons and moral subjects whose self-ownership and conscientious responsibility warrants respect. The emancipated family, together with property and morality, is prerequisite for both social and political freedom. Unless the family is liberated from traditional hierarchies rooted in gender and sexual orientation, family members cannot equally exercise social and political freedom. The civil society in which individuals enjoy economic and legal self-determination follows upon property, morality, and the emancipated family, but precedes self-government because citizens cannot exercise political freedom if given privileges order their society, allowing some to dominate others socially. <coughs> the self-governing state must therefore contain and uphold all the pre-political institutions of right. Otherwise, citizens face obstacles to their political involvement that make it impossible for all to exercise political self-determination. This is why the state does not require some higher authority to compel it to uphold property, moral, family, and social rights. Unless the state sustains all pre-political freedoms, it cannot be a self-governing polity. The systematic unity of the institutions of right has important implications for how the reality of self-determination can come into being. This genesis is a normative history of freedom that philosophy can address. Hegel is often mistaken for a perpetrator of an a priori descriptive theory of what must happen in history. Hegel, however, like every philosopher worthy of the name, recognizes that convention is inherently arbitrary and that philosophy can never conceive what must happen in history. Instead, philosophy can conceive what the institutions of freedom are and can then consider what must happen in order for those institutions to come into being. This normative history of freedom follows the conception of all the spheres of right, as it does in Hegel's philosophy of right, and has as its prescriptive end none other than the realization of those institutions of self-determination. There is no descriptive necessity that right come into being or remain in place. Both natural and conventional occurrences can preclude or destroy the institutions of freedom. Nonetheless, the normative, prescriptive history of freedom can have some descriptive application when property, moral accountability, the emancipated family, civil society, and self-government have factually arisen to some recognizable degree. In his lectures on the philosophy of history, Hegel carries out just such an application. He begins by making the corrigible, empirical judgment that the Protestant Reformation, the Industrial Revolution, and the French Revolution exhibit how the institutions of right are, in fact, coming into being in modern times. Hegel then proposes that we look back at recorded history and reinterpret it in light of the normative conception of the philosophy of right as a history of freedom showing the empirical genesis of right. What, however, should we do practically when we find ourselves standing within this history? We may be conversant with the philosophy of right and understand what are the institutions comprising the reality of self-determination. But how can we use this philosophical conception to guide our practice? This is not a question of bringing the institutions of freedom into being in a world devoid of right. If that were our predicament, we would be in a purely moral situation, where we aim to generate a good that is not yet at hand, and that depends wholly on our initiative for its determination and emergence. Nor are we in the revolutionary position of founders of a state 
who must bring into being a new constitution of freedom in its entirety. The foundation-free character of the reality of self-determination signifies that there can be no privileged procedure that must be followed to confer validity <clears throat> upon the institutions of right. What makes the structures of self-determination valid is not how they arise, but that they are institutions of freedom, conforming to the concept of the system of right. Since self-determination consists in relations of right, which are not particular privileges, but inherently universal and lawful modes of freedom, they are susceptible to and deserve constitutional enactment and protection. A constitution, however, cannot come into being through constitutional means, any more than the institutions of right can arise through an exercise of the freedoms in which they consist. The founding of a constitution can occur in manifold ways, none of which consists in an act of self-determination. The act of constitution making produces a constitutional order that does not yet exist, and therefore does not contain the activity by which it is founded. It lacks the reflexivity of self-determination, whereby the agent determines not just the content, but the form of its own agency. Constitution making, however it transpires, must take into account the systematic interconnection of the different spheres of right. This is something that bedeviled Napoleon when, impersonating world spirit on horseback, he tried to impose a new modern constitution upon pre-modern tradition-bound Spain. No unilateral political enactment, however, can make a constitution. The body politic is not an artifact arising when form is imposed upon inert matter by an external artificer. The reality of freedom is a system that cannot exist unless its constitutive members know and will the rights they exercise. Moreover, as Hegel well knew, democracy cannot be imposed upon a community that has yet to undergo a religious reformation, allowing for freedom of conscience and a secular space for self-government. Nor can individuals participate as citizens of a free state if they are trapped in patriarchal households, subjugating women, or laboring in pre-modern societies in which birthright obstructs economic opportunity and equality before the law. New constitutions can be instituted thanks to foreign intervention, as done successfully in post-war Germany and Japan, which both quickly embraced the most emancipated institutions they had ever had. Despite their preceding postmodern tyrannies, where privileged particularity overrode the universality of right. These nations had religious cultures, family relations, social institutions, and underground political tradition that could quickly facilitate widespread engagement in civil society and democratic government. The fiery, unconditioned surrender of the old regimes did not leave behind a vacuum, but a phoenix awaiting reanimation. Today, many of us stand not in a revolutionary situation. We're founding a new constitution is the order of the day. But in a situation calling for reform, where right has a significant institutionalization, but one that is flawed and incomplete, how can the philosophy of right guide our efforts? The challenge facing citizens of the United States today is of key importance because of both the global, military, economic, scientific, and cultural power of the United States and the influence of its constitution, which is the oldest continuously operative one in the world. The United States Constitution is also one of the briefest constitutions in existence. This brevity reflects the narrow range of its provisions, which leave unaddressed many of the forms of self-determination that the philosophy of rights specifies. The United States Constitution exhibits the influence of the classical liberal social contract tradition, 
upon its founders insofar as its constitutional statutes delineate little more than the basic property and civil legal rights of its citizens together with their political freedoms within its representative majoritarian democracy. Totally absent from the United States Constitution is any mention of the distinctly household and social rights of its citizens and residents. The problematic consequences of these omissions have come to the fore at three crucial junctures in United States history. First, soon after the conclusion of the Civil War, when the defeated, seditious southern states were still occupied by the federal army, the newly freed slaves put forward two demands. In every liberated southern state, they called for the distribution of land to themselves to provide for their economic welfare and for free public education so that they could benefit from the schooling of which they had been deprived. They recognized that it was not enough to obtain the status of free individuals who had equality before the law and the right to vote and hold office, rights which had been secured by the recently ratified 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Without the resources for exercising their social freedom, the newly freed slaves could not escape social bondage and truly enjoy equal rights in the reunited republic. The former slaves had reason to call for 40 acres and a mule since the dearth of free labor in the southern plantation society made independent farming a more likely basis for economic independence than employment. <coughs> Neither of these social rights demands were fulfilled once federal troops were withdrawn and Reconstruction came to an end. Instead of genuine emancipation, the former slaves fell prey to a new peonage imposed by a century of white supremacist terror, enforcing the legal discrimination of the Jim Crow regime that stood until the victories of the Civil Rights Movement. The problems exposed by the demands of the liberated slaves did not just apply to their plight. Their general extension was highlighted in 1944, when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt delivered his last address to Congress, declaring that the United States Constitution was inadequate to realize freedom in face of modern society, and needed to be supplemented by a new social bill of rights. These rights included the right to employment at a fair wage, to food and clothing, to health care, to decent housing, and to education, none of which the United States Constitution guarantees. Although FDR died before he could implement these rights, they were all enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, drafted by a United Nations Committee, headed by Eleanor Roosevelt, and adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1948. Although these rights were put in the new constitution of most nations that gained independence in the subsequent wave of decolonization, they remain largely unenforced in much of the world, including in the United States, despite its ratification of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The call for a new social bill of rights was renewed in 1968, when Martin Luther King launched his Poor People's Campaign. King knew that the triumphs of the Civil Rights Movement, restoring legal equality and political rights to African Americans, were not enough to achieve genuine emancipation. Legal and political freedom remained all too formal if social rights were not recognized and enforced. In particular, the material right to employment at a fair wage and to equivalent income for the disabled and retired should be guaranteed to give everyone the economic independence and security on which family welfare and fair political involvement depended. The Poor People's Campaign drive for a new social bill of rights fell on deaf ears. And here we are. 50 years later, with the richest, most powerful nation in human history 
leading the developed world in social inequality, mass poverty, employee disempowerment, ill health, educational failure, and mass incarceration. Can Hegel's philosophy of right offer the fundamental principles for remedying the impoverishment of freedom in the United States and other nations that follow the neoliberal reduction of self-determination to property right and free enterprise. Admittedly, Hegel violates his own conception of household freedom by retaining patriarchal privilege and limiting marriage to heterosexual partners. It is easy, however, to remedy Hegel's inconsistencies, as I have attempted in my book, The Just Family, and develop a conception of family self-determination that social and political relations should accommodate. Similarly, although Hegel's account of civil society retains feudal estate divisions and only begins to recognize the central role of capital in market relations, we can correct these lapses and conceive how social freedom realizes itself in full. I have sought to do just this in three books, The Just Economy, Law in Civil Society, and Rethinking Capital. These together provide a systematic account of civil society, which prescribes the social rights that citizens must have accommodated to escape social domination, obstructing political opportunity, and partake in self-government without sacrificing social opportunity. Finally, although Hegel compromises his account of political freedom by letting feudal estates retain political privileges, keeping patriarchal limitations on political freedom, and choosing the head of state by dynastic succession. All these violations of political right can be remedied, as I have attempted in the just state rethinking self-government. In sum, the theoretical principles of household, social, and political self-determination are all available if we stand on the shoulders of Hegel and do as theoreticians what Hegel should have done himself. Nonetheless, working out the philosophical conception of right is one thing. Transforming this conception into a political platform to reform an existing constitutional state is another. I have spent much of my philosophical career tackling the philosophy of right and going beyond Hegel's achievement to develop, in theory, the three spheres of ethical community, the emancipating family, civil society, and self-government. The results may be largely unknown, but the work is there sitting in all the great research libraries of the world. After the presidential election of Donald Trump in 2016, I decided the time was right to leave the ivory tower and run for United States Congress in the 2018 election. My aim was to use my congressional campaign to advance the agenda of a new social bill of rights, drawing upon the philosophy of right to formulate concrete policy solutions to the impairments of freedom in the United States. Because the National Congress enacts legislation that applies to the United States as a whole, a congressional campaign can advance the most far-reaching policies that require implementation at a national level. These can address all the social rights that the United States Constitution fails to guarantee, but which the philosophy of right prescribes. Today, the United States has an electoral system in which the vote of citizens in primary elections determines, in almost all cases, who will run as the party nominee in the general election. This primary selection procedure reflects how the United States body politic is not a parliamentary system where party organizations directly control candidate nominations and financing. Instead, prospective candidates can appeal directly to the electorate to win the position of party nominee and thereby determine what the party advocates. This independence, however, comes at the cost of primary candidates having to finance their campaigns 
without any initial support from the party for whose nomination they are competing. My platform proposed concrete solutions to the deficits in social freedom that put our families in jeopardy and hamstring our political participation. The anchor of my new Bill of Social Rights was a federal job guarantee which would secure the right to employment at a fair wage. Guaranteed employment is the ultimate foundation of economic independence and security in civil society, where market freedom operates, fostering a competitive system of enterprises. Civil society offers various modes of earning a living, engendering the three class groupings of entrepreneurs, landlords, and employees who live on respectively <laughs> profits and dividends, rent and wages or salaries. Competition, however, makes the employee-employer relation decisive for economic security. Because enterprises must grow and concentrate to survive, leading to an economy where the overwhelming majority of breadwinners must seek employment from a much smaller array of employers. This imbalance in opportunity makes the right to a job at a fair wage something on which all further rights depend. To the extent that, without a job or income, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, one has neither life nor liberty nor the opportunity to pursue happiness. Since the market can never ensure that all adult members of civil society have sufficient employment, our state must step in as employer of last resort and put everyone who wants a job to work. As Hegel pointed out in the philosophy of right, social freedom is not secured by giving people handouts. Instead, civil society should provide the opportunity to earn a living for everyone who is able and willing. Admittedly, as Hegel noted, unemployment will only increase if the state puts people to work in undertakings that compete with private enterprise. Civil society, however, is not too poor to provide for its members, since the state can offer the unemployed jobs that supply goods and services our community needs, but which private enterprise is failing to provide. A federal job guarantee should involve two other measures, which I advanced. First, people should be offered work at a fair wage. A fair wage is not just a living wage, providing for basic subsistence. Such a basic income is a recipe for continued poverty and the continued fall of the share of wages in the national income as the distribution of wealth becomes more and more unequal. Instead, there should be a fair minimum wage tied to increases in both inflation and productivity. Then everyone shares in the growth of national prosperity and enjoys the fair economic opportunity to which civil society should be committed. Accordingly, I called for a new minimum fair wage of $20 an hour, which modestly represents what the minimum wage should be if adjusted for inflation and productivity gains. Second, anyone who is genuinely disabled or retired should receive income equivalent to the fair minimum wage offered to everyone able and willing to work. This does not violate Hegel's injunction against solving poverty by putting people on the dole, for it applies only to those who are no longer able to earn a living on their own. I further called for two key measures to balance the playing field between employee and employer. The economic opportunities of employees are progressively diminished by the concentration and consolidation of enterprises, as well as by the accelerating threats to employee solidarity entailed in globalization and the rising gig economy. To advance all interests on a par in accord with the right of civil society, we need to have mandatory collective bargaining for all employees and give employees at least half the seats on the boards of directors of corporations. Otherwise, the disempowerment of employees 
will continue unabated and contribute to social and political inequality. A federal job guarantee combined with a fair minimum wage and employee empowerment can wipe out unemployment and go far towards eliminating poverty, which, as Hegel recognized, is a deprivation of not just means of subsistence, but the social resources to exercise one's freedom as a family member, a civilian, and a citizen. Moreover, the job guarantee can lift the fear of firing that stifles resistance to sexual harassment and discrimination at work, provide maximum buying power to enhance economic activity, and insulate the economy against recessions and depressions by maintaining full employment. More must be done, however, to guarantee family welfare and fulfill the social rights to health care, housing education, and legal representation. To ensure that employees can fulfill their family rep responsibilities without jeopardizing their careers, I call for paid emergency family leave, nine month paid parental leave, paid one month vacations, and the prohibition of mandatory overtime, as well as free public child care and free public elder care. To wipe out child poverty, and ensure that fair minimum wages suffice to support a family. I called for child allowances of $500 per month per child. To make health care a right, I called for a comprehensive single-payer health insurance system with no co-pays or deductibles. To make decent housing available to all, I called for the federal job guarantee to put people to work building affordable housing to guarantee everyone access to quality education at all levels. I called for national funding of public schools at an equal level for every child, free tuition and living stipends for attending public colleges and public technical schools, and two years of philosophy studies in every secondary school. <laughs> Finally, to ensure that everyone has comparable legal representation in both criminal and civil cases, I proposed a public legal care insurance program. This would operate on the model of a public health care insurance program, giving individuals the freedom to seek legal services from any lawyer of their choosing while covering all costs of personal legal representation, which would be negotiated on a national level to ensure affordable legal fees. All these measures fulfill universal social rights on which family welfare and political freedom depends. They should not be contingent upon means tests that restrict them to the needy, dividing society into haves and haves nots, and jeopardizing general support. Although these opportunities would be available to everyone, they do disproportionately benefit those whose exercise of freedom is most impaired. Nietzsche can thus claim that universal social rights represent a slave morality insofar as their enforcement <coughs> most serves the disadvantage. This, however, does not undercut their universality, as Nietzsche falsely maintains. For social rights remain entitlements for all. Moreover, where the compensations these measures provide do not offset all their costs, these expenses can be fairly funded as I advocated, through highly graduated wealth and income taxes that target those most able to pay. The resulting platform for a new social bill of rights concretely tackles the task, delineated in principle from the philosophy of right, of securing everyone's self-determination in the household, civil society, and the state. This platform should appeal to all voters, no matter what their race, gender, sexual orientation, or economic position. Instead of serving political interests at the expense of others, the legalization of these social rights forwards the universal realization of freedom <coughs> to which politics properly aims. Could such a platform win over the voters in the conservative, largely rural, small town, 25 county, 10th Congressional District of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs>
Nearly two-thirds of his voters supported Donald Trump and his fellow Republican candidates in the 2016 election. My primary campaign, however, addressed an electorate of Democratic Party supporters who are overwhelmingly African American, although African Americans make up only a quarter of district voters as a whole. In the large university town of Athens, there is a sizable Democratic Party majority, which includes many who are not African Americans. Outside of Athens, however, most whites have deserted the Democratic Party, which many see as privileging the interests of minorities while ignoring those of everyone else. I face two opponents. One, a less radical white woman who emphasized her identity as a mother, a Christian, and a small town Georgian. And the other, an African American woman who entered the race at the last moment, raised hardly any money, had almost no campaign staff, and did hardly any campaigning. I focused on my social rights agenda, which I presented at Democratic Party county meetings, union local meetings, community organizations, and African American churches, as well as by door-to-door -door canvassing, phone calls, mailings, and advertising on some local radio stations. Although I raised enough money and had enough volunteers to get my message out to an audience wider than that of my opponents, I was not able to make my existence, let alone my platform, known to more than a minority of primary voters. The local TV, local radio and TV stations, and the dwindling newspapers simply do not cover congressional races in the 10th district. And most voters do not access online social media. With poverty widespread, public transportation lacking, and many working long hours on several jobs, the majority of Democratic Party voters simply have no time or means of informing themselves of candidates and policies. Still, most observers found the election results completely unexpected, shocking, and almost farcical. The African-American candidate, who remained virtually unknown and largely absent from the fray, won more than 50% of the vote and clinched the Democratic Party nomination. Some speculated about fraud or Republican Party manipulation. The likely truth is that most Democratic primary voters, who are mainly African American, came to the polls with absolutely no knowledge of the three candidates for Congress. They made their decision on the basis of the names they saw, one of which seemed to be African American. Identity triumphed over policy, in the absence of exposure to candidate programs. Nonetheless, a sizable minority of 10th District Georgia voters did encounter the social rights agenda, which is more than ever before. Bringing it to the center of political debate here and beyond remains a challenge facing anyone who looks to the philosophy of right as a guide for practice. Este, bueno, vamos a abrir el micrófono para preguntas, comentarios. Eh, lo formulo en español, sí. como guste, para que tú lo traduzcas con más precisión. Bueno, primero, ¿se escucha? Sí. Primero, eh, agradecerle al profesor, sus libros han sido una guía para muchos de nosotros muchos alumnos que se forman conmigo pasan a través de sus textos y, y quisiera expresarle primero mi, mi, nuestro agradecimiento Gracias. mi cuestión es un poco más eh, digamos enfocada a la práctica política por ejemplo cuando, cuando nosotros leímos 
la parte final de la rutina de, de la esencia, la realidad efectiva. Y pensábamos que justamente esa unidad entre el concepto y el ser puede servir de guía política. Nos preguntábamos qué papel juega la contingencia en la acción política, aún si uno está guiado por un concepto que, como en el caso suyo, parece racional. Es decir, a nosotros como, como gente de izquierda, creo que nos podemos definir así, nos interesa mucho ver su punto de vista, comprender su punto de vista sobre cómo pensar la contingencia en la acción política y cómo poder reducir ese margen de contingencia o si es inevitable o si debemos aceptar simplemente que el pasaje del concepto a la realidad efectiva es más bien un voto piadoso nuestra por lo menos mi pregunta es sobre la acción política y tiene que ver obviamente con, con la cuestión de Marx nosotros también estudiamos mucho a Marx y nos preguntamos justamente bajo los conceptos marxistas cómo poder pensar la práctica política y su contingencia Okay, uh, uh, do, you, do you want to answer him first or do you want to? Uh, okay. Marx to some degree. And many Marxists reject the idea that there can be any normative politics. That there can, that there can even be a theory of the just state. So, so we have to talk of. Uh, The withering away of the state, Así que tenemos que hablar de la desaparición del Estado. Or the view shared by Lenin and Max Weber. O la, o la visión que tenía that, Lenin o Max Weber. That the state is simply an instrument of power with no inherent ends of its own. De que el Estado es simplemente un instrumento de, de poder y de clase. But on the contrary, I, 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 I think Hegel is correct in recognizing that the reality of freedom must have its conservation in self-government. But self-government cannot operate without civil society and independence of the household and recognition of moral accountability. 